Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first of a series of 24 webinars funded by MLA called the Sheep Productivity and Profitability Webinar Series. I'd like to make a, a special welcome to our past webinar participants tonight. Thank you for coming back online and also acknowledging uh, those people who have registered for this new webinar series. Thanks for signing up and showing your interest and in supporting what should be a great, uh, a great activity for the sheep uh, and livestock industry. And we hope that we can deliver uh, the relevant topics when you need them over the next 12 months. For those who are unacquainted with the webinar platform, and this control panel that you can see on the right hand side of the screen now should be up on the right hand side of your screen as well. Um, you should be able to hear us, but we can't actually hear you. Now on the control panel, there's a red button. If you want to collapse the control panel and get it out of the road and you can view the presentation uh, in full, then just press that. And then if you need to reinstate that control panel, just press it again, it'll come back for you. Now that questions box that you can see there at the bottom of the control panel is very important. Um, it's where you submit your questions throughout the webinar and in chronological order, we'll answer them uh, at the end of the webinar so that everyone gets a chance to, um, you know, really utilize the, uh, the present presenters that we have available to us over this series. And anyone wants to pop in um, what the weather's doing in their side of the woods, that it lets us know that you know where the, the box is and that you can hear me correctly. Just before we move on, Wednesday next week, we've got another webinar. Um, it's going to be on Wednesday. It's a more suitable time of the week for the presenter. There's The topic is around, there's data that suggests that producers aren't finishing lambs as fast as they should. Uh, the genetics are there, so why aren't we? Let's go talk about pastures and what's required to maintain 300 grams a day to slaughter in our prime lamb operations. So that's going to be presented by Hamish Dixon out of South Australia. And he's a director of a consult consultancy firm over there called uh, AgriPartner. So tonight's presenters is... Uh, Key presenter is Dr. Jim Fagona from Graminus Consulting. Uh, Jim studied at the University of Sydney, uh, majoring predominantly in agronomy before completing a postgraduate work uh, postgraduate studies in plant physiology at Macquarie University and ANU. Pasture agronomy has been Jim's focus over the past 25 years, working as New South Wales DPI and then as an academic at CSU. His areas of expertise include pasture establishment, grazing management, species evaluation, and the integration of livestock and cropping enterprises. Jim's got a keen interest in understanding and influence in farm management. He's a dynamic and entertaining speaker, and I'm really looking forward to listening to him tonight, and he's very well resourced to deliver this presentation. Now, also on the bench, or should I say on the panel, is Nathan Ferguson. Now, Nathan is the business partner of Jim, and they work in Graminus Consulting together. And Nate has been providing advice to agriculture since 1996 and has a broad technical background in agronomy. He's worked in retail agronomy for a few years in the Wimmera and with the New South Wales Public Services District, District Agronomist at Canamble. And now he resides in Tumut, where he's in, um, in partnership with Jim and their business, Graminus Consulting. So looking forward very much to hearing from Jim and then Nathan a little bit later on tonight. So with that, um, I'm going to hand over um, to Jim. Can you see my staff now? G'day, Jim. Yep. Um, uh, you've been made the presenter. Please close. Confidential windows. When ready, show my screen. Okay, Jim. Okay, is that okay, Dave? You've got it? Yep, that's yeah. it. Okay, good. Good, uh, good Jim. I'll get you then. All right. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thanks for joining the webinar tonight. And uh, special thanks also to um, uh, David and Holmes and Sackett for inviting me um, 
to uh, present what is going to be a challenging talk. Um, um, I was only given the topic last Wednesday, but we'll see how we go. It's also great uh, to be able to present a seminar in your pyjamas with a glass of Chardonnay handy. So hopefully it'll go well. Uh, by way of it, just a, a few, uh, just to kick off with a few um, limitations to the talk. Tonight, we're not talking about symptomology, like a particularly um, particular symptoms of particular problems. For instance, if you like, you know, the damage done by red-legged earth mites or loosened fleeter leaves or, uh, you know, uh, what uh, what a certain, what potassium deficiency looks like or anything like that. I, I mean... We, we instead wanted to focus the talk on the bigger ticket items of what's going, what do we see when a pasture isn't quite, isn't quite going to expectation. Um, and so I guess that's called malperformance. And, um, and w when we look at that, what, what would we potentially be looking for? Um, um, also, um, I'm many things, but a photographer, I am not. So you'll see a range of pho photographs tonight that uh, um, certainly wouldn't make it up on the weather wall on Channel 10 or anything like that. But anyway, hopefully they'll illustrate what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, second apology in advance, because Nathan and I both work in southern New South Wales, then look, most of the um, most of the examples and the systems that uh, we're talking about will be you know, drawn from our work in southern New South Wales. I only hope that, um, given that you can be from anywhere, that you'll find something in that that uh, you might be able to take home with you um, uh, in considering um, what I'm about to present. Um, but a recurring theme tonight will be the, the great value um, in having a look, in just stopping, um, um, stopping, um, uh, bending over and just observing what is there. Um, there's quite a bit to be learned. And sometimes, you know, they're not particularly profound lessons, but they are things that we should all be doing um, because it's about managing a resource uh, which is incredibly valuable to us. Um, and before I go on, I, I'll, I'll go through a cautionary tale. So here's a little story about perhaps observing jumping to conclusions. Uh, here we go. So in the following slides, we'll see various views of a clapped out pasture. So what I'll do here, not knowing how long this is all taking to load, I'll just wait, pause for one or two seconds as we look through each photo. So here's a photo of a pasture on my very own property. And I thought when I bought the property, I thought, well, this is just a crappy pasture. and um, uh, I'll replace it in time. That's pretty soon. It's only a small paddock. I'll replace it and, and that'll be that. Um, and I looked at it and thought there's, well, let's just look at it a little bit more closely. You look at it a bit more closely and it's dominated by silver grass. It's got a heap of other crap in it, essentially. It's got um, a lot of residue, right? Um, and it's got no legume. So just going through those. So the dominant species there is silvergrass. You might call it vulpia or something like that. I hope um, it's a genus vulpia. Uh, it's got two or three different species that are uh, 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 usually. There's a lot of trash from the previous year. There's no legume or very little legume, as, and it was like that last spring as well. Um, and actually, uh, you won't see it necessarily that easy, but my little mouse is now pointing in the centre of the screen to a, a bit of residue, which is actually witchgrass or hairy panic, um, which came through um, from last summer. All right. So naturally, I, th I thought about this and I thought, well, that's pretty, you know, the story here is going to be pretty obvious. Yeah, like like the pasture's been undergrazed. That's why there's trash there from last year. That's 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 pretty obvious I would have thought. There seems to be a lack of nitrogen in this system and it's favoured species like silver grass that scavenge nitrogen fairly efficiently. Um, that seems to be a reasonable conclusion and, and the lack of legume look is probably caused by low soil phosphorus um, because I happen to know that, well or suspect at least, 
that superphosphate hadn't been applied for years. Well, uh, uh, I got the first one right, basically. I'm pretty sure the second one's about right. But the third one was a bit of a question, and it can essentially only be verified by doing a bit of soil testing. So there's no point in observing just alone, somewhere around the track that our, our assumptions and our thoughts have to be corroborated by some form of evidence, uh, in this case, a soil test. Now, I was lucky enough to have uh, an ex-colleague at New South Wales DPI who was after a low phosphorus paddock in the cropping zone. I said, oh, mate, I've got the paddock for you, you know? It's just near my house. You can do your trial work and we can have a beer. It'll all be great. So he came out and did some soil tests. And he, in fact, he was so keen about the whole idea, he put four little transects through uh, that paddock. And so he had actually four measurements. And here are the results. Now, I don't know what you know about the measurement of soil phosphorus, but the cobalt phosphorus there uh, in every case is about is about, well, anywhere between 20 um, and, say, 35 parts per million above what would be required to near maximise the growth for subclover. Now, that's about 30 parts per million or milligrams per kilogram, now, sometimes referred to as a critical value. So, so my whole assumption was, was totally wrong. I mean, I thought all I'd need to do in that paddock is maybe for a few years until I could get the money to do it up. I just spread a bit of clover maybe and put a bit of super on and everything would be fine. Well, I didn't need to put any super on at all. There's heaps of there's heaps of phosphorus in the soil. I don't know how it got there and I'm not about to do the detective work to find out. But the critical problem with the paddock um, is actually the pH and the associated high percentage of exchangeable aluminium. Um, now, I don't know whether that's cause or effect, actually. It's a bit of a complex issue, but that's obviously one of the issues that's holding that paddock um, back. So I thought, given the history, it had to be phosphorus, but the low pH and lack of legume may or may not be related. I don't know that for sure. The legume might not be there because of, um, you know, a previous poor herbicide management or something like that. And the cause of the problem, the low pH, you know, who knows? I mean, but one would think um, uh, the acidity basically is partly caused by the fact that there's only annual species in there um, and they're very shallow rooted. And so there would have been over the years, perhaps a fair bit of nitrate leaching, et cetera, et cetera, not getting into it. But the real point of what I'm trying to say is, is I jumped to a conclusion myself thinking, this is an easy fix. Just by observation, I'll just whack phosphorus on. And it just so happened. In such a small paddock, I probably wouldn't have even tested it. But because my mate was interested in finding out what was going on in there, I found out that I was just basically jumping to a conclusion, right? Uh, something I wouldn't have done actually on a client's pace. We, we would have tested it. Anyway, for all of that, I still think we can learn a fair bit by just having a look. So tonight... Um, what we're going to do is talk firstly a little bit about malperformance and performance. Uh, I mean, what do we mean? You know, for some reason, if you think something's not performing, then it's obviously under some sort of uh, benchmark that you would that you'd find acceptable, right? So that leads us to the question: you know, is there an ideal pasture after all? Is there something that we're really shooting for? And what are the signs of what would the signs of performance be? What could we get a sort of broad definition to go forward with? So we'll talk about that, um, and then I'll make a few comments on observing pastures, which I've already alluded to. But it's just a few things that I need to say, get off my chest, um, because of the key importance of of not utilising um, not utilising uh, the opportunity to um, to just go and have a look. Then we'll just have a look at some indicators of malperformance, some just classic fence line type comparisons and, and, and have a think about um, what might be causing the problems there. And hopefully that'll stimulate a few questions, a few thoughts. Um, uh, such uh, indicators might be sort of like ill, Ill thrift. It's, it's just not growing like it should. 
or like the neighbour's place. The presence of indicator species, certain species thrive under certain conditions um, um, that are also linked to, uh, well, underperformance or malperformance. Um, species composition, you know, the percent of this and the percent of that, how much can that tell us or be an indication of malperformance? And other, par and other aspects of pasture conditions such as perennial cover, trash load, bare patches, etc. To think at this state that there are, um, just on that, final, that last issue, just to think that there are some hard and fast levels out there that have been published and verified, etc., would be to make a mistake. There aren't. We couldn't even tell you what the um, ideal cover of Phalaris would be for a pasture. I can't do it for my clients. Um, I'm aware of no publication that, that would actually help me. So there is a bit of subjectivity involved, for sure. If a, clearly, if a, you know, if a, um, if a paddock is, you know, dominated by Phalaris year in, year out with reasonable clover in between, it's the last thing in the world that we would be pulling out of, um, to do anything else with. Um, but somehow from, from that down to, oh, well, every 10 steps I, I look down and I might see a Phalaris plant, you know, it's incredibly thin, it's almost all but disappeared. Well, in that particular case, we have to make a, you know, in that continuum from that up to the ideal, somewhere there, you, there has to be a decision made saying, well, this is no longer functioning the way I want it to function. We should look, be looking at replacing it. Um, so, um, but there are no hard and fast published verified uh, levels out there to draw upon. I might say the same for Lucen, which, and you know, it'll become a recurring theme, so I might as well tell you that Lucen pastures and Phalaris pastures are essentially the main, uh, uh, the main perennials in, in, in pastures that we deal with. Is there an ideal pasture? Uh, well, I think pastures are a little bit like intelligence. Um, um, it's sort of like this, nobody can, exactly define what, what it is, but we all recognise it by its absence. And so you only have to look on Twitter. Anyway, so we could really spend a whole night talking about the ideal pasture and I don't want to. I would prefer instead to be to be talking about to to be talking about malperformance, but here are a few thoughts. In short the short answer I believe to is there an ideal pasture is no. Um, it may please the good folk at Homes and Sack to hear that ultimately the for good pasture is the profitability of the livestock enterprise that's running on it. The pasture is only a component um, um, of that, but it's an important component, of course, But and certainly in the short to long term, you know. So it's not just about short term profitability, it's about uh, keeping the system um, in, in a sustainable, uh, profitable in a sustainable way. Um, some of you might have been associated with or even hosted for all I know pasture competitions but because I don't think there's a, such a thing as an ideal pasture I don't think the pasture competition per se some sort of cosmetic view of pastures saying oh look it's got exactly the right amount of clover exactly the right amount of phalaris or copsewood or whatever else or ryegrass and it looks beautiful I mean I, I can't see that as a very helpful concept I mean in the end um, uh, you know, one could get very cosmetic with pastures and try and treat every weed that you ever see, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think it's a profitable way of running the joint, you know. I think in a way, so we've got to be talking essentially in, in broad ranges. Let's think even just narrow this down to legume content. Both Australian and European studies agree that legume content of around, let's say, on average, over the years, in a productive pasture of around 30 to 40 percent, would be desirable from not only a nitrogen cycling perspective, but also um, from an animal perspective. Um, a recent paper by Lusher, I believe, in um, in Grass and Forage Science from Europe, just it was amazing. Just comes up with the same sorts of numbers, right? So that'd be good. But we all know that from year to year. That's just not achievable. There's a whole range of reasons, particularly the interaction with the season, the type of seasons you get, late breaks. Say, um, you know, for those of us who rely on subterranean clover as the main legume, late breaks versus early breaks, um, 
the um, amount of carryover trash from the season before a whole range of a whole there are a whole range of reasons why it's impossible to lock in and aim for um, it, um, from a on a year to year basis a certain percentage uh, of, of a certain species and we'll talk about percentages later for instance um, for what I've just said, I mean, after it, it's a it's a very common observation that after a very hard year, like a very dry summer, um, and and very um, with a lot of hard grazing, a lot of bare areas, the next year is usually, um, in inverted commas, a good clover year. Well, why? Well, a hell of a lot of the hard seed in the seed bank has broken down. Um, um, the physiology of all of that is actually understood. So, aiming for this ideal pasture is a bit of a problem. And for that reason, a snapshot through time is a bit of a problem in itself because it's 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 these things are these things are, are fluid, uh, you know, various aspects of partial performance. And so I think you know, just saying, oh, it had you know, last year it was good clover, this year it's bad clover. I think you've got to be running our observations over time rather than in general just taking one look. And on having a look. I just want to say a couple of quick things, and, and I've been guilty of this myself and made my mistakes. The other day for a client, I was looking at a potential property to be bought. And I thought earlier on, we, I was making this mistake of just not stopping off often enough because we we're trying to work out in some of the pastures just how much Phalaris was there. And in the end, you just can't do that from inside a windscreen. No matter, I, maybe you can, but I can't. I have to stop, I have to get out. If I'm on a bike, I have to get off it or whatever. I have to get down and have a look. I mean, you just, so I find windscreen agronomy is a bit of a problem. Stop, take the time, smell the roses, whatever. Get out and have a look um, because it's, that's a lot more valuable. Um, I don't think there's a lot to be learned by speeding 60 kilometres an hour through a paddock. Um, I might be wrong, but I certainly can't learn that fast. You also got to look, species misidentification has been shown with young agronomists to be a major problem um, and it would be with farmers and the like too. So it's very important to actually know what you're looking at and even it's a common problem. So if, if you're having problems with that, there's always, you know, good, you know, there's, there's always good banks of images here and there. I use Google images all the time for some species, some things that I haven't seen before and have an inkling of what it might be. And, and there's a couple of good books, but I think you really need to sort of, if, if you're going to get into this, that sort of, you know, if you're going to make useful observations, you've got to know what you're reserving, I suppose. Local names are a bit of a problem too, so it's important it's sort of um, are over the range of names that can be used for a species. Look, it's, it's funny to me a lot that people spend a hell of a lot of money um, establishing a pasture. Now you can go into all the costs, the loss of production and all the rest of it, but can't actually identify what they've just sown. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I still have to tell people the difference between Phalaris and Coxfoot and, and all the rest of it, right? So I, I, I do think it's worth spending a little time getting to know those things. Um, and, and finally, you know, storing observations in some way, even if they're just notes, even if there's photos from a, from a reference point from year to year, I think that could be a useful, simple way of, of, um, of uh, I don't know, um, of making sure that your observations tally from year to year, basically. I lost a word there. Um, so why? Because performance is not based on an ideal state, but a range of states. So I actually think, yeah, look, that it'd be great if you could have leg in percentage at 40% per annum, but I know it's going to vary between 50 and 60, 15 and 60 or whatever. What I'm really interested in is if it's five or low year after year after year, because that's when the system is going to collapse. So here's some classic signs of pasture malperformance. Now, I took these uh what's today for uh thursday so i took these yesterday on a property um in a 600 millimeter rainfall zone um, near the billabong creek in southern new south wales now this is just classic nitrogen deficiency um and uh, how can i tell well you know the dung and you first of all uh, very importantly actually um often 
often you'll look at dung and urine patches in a paddock and you'll see that the animals haven't been grazing around them and have grazed everything else. And that can make the rest of the stuff look like uh, um, because all the green stuff on top has been grazed out and all the yellow stuff below is left behind. So you think, oh, those bits are nitrogen deficient. Yeah, that's a bit of a problem because that may or may not be the case. In this particular case, although the show, photo doesn't show it that well, most of the stuff that you're looking at there is basically even height. So it's been some time since that paddock's been grazed. And the, and the, and the light green stuff, is it about the same height as the dark green stuff? It's just not thriving. What do we mean? Well, look on the right hand side of the screen. If you just contrast the two, you can see, well, you can pick it up yourself, really. I mean, it's it's just it's a deeper green. There's a hell of a lot more leaf per square per per area. Um, there's a lot more shoots per area. Those shoots are bigger, rah, rah, rah. I mean, so what are we looking like? Um, it looks like nitrogen deficiency. Uh, best to always compare on a patch that's not been grazed. I've said that. What does nitrogen do? When, if you're thinking about what does nitrogen do? Well, nitrogen increases grass t grass tillers and leaf number and size. It, you know, on a on a on a smaller scale, it influences cell size and number. That's what it's actually doing the plant. So you just get bigger stuff and more of it. There you go. It increases leaf protein and chlorophyll content, so you get greener leaves. It increases reproductive output. We can't quite see that, but anybody who uses nitrogen on a crop understands it's going to have a direct effect on the number of grains that are formed. And it changes the species composition. You know, deficiency favours species that scavenge and well, like silvergrass. Uh, and deficiency, actually, if, if there's a legume seed back there, it favours legumes because they can fix their own um, nitrogen um, uh, sometimes, as long as the other resources are there, like phosphorus or whatever. So. So that's what nitrogen sort of does. And so when you when you think about those photographs that we just saw, nitrogen wasn't there. And what did we see as a result? Well, we saw hardly of anything that was, you know, hardly any tillering, hardly any uh, shoots were small, shoots were light green, et cetera. This is a fascinating photo um, that we just took the other week down near Holbrook. And uh, it's a paddock that usually gets cut for silage. And last year, the trash was laid in these rows, right, for a while. Um, and I think it might have just stayed there and broken down over the summer. And when you go into this paddock, it's 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 amazing. You've got these rows of thickened, like thickened, massive vegetation, which is just thriving essentially on the fact that there's more nitrogen in the in those trashed rows from last year, right? And and if you go in between them, yeah, sure, the rye grass is there, but it's not doing nearly as well. But it's the same sort of stuff. Bigger leaves, more tillers, rah, rah, rah. Here's one of my favorite. This is, look, I only took this last Monday. This is um, on the left. We have, um, well, you just have a look at it. We're down the 700 to 750 millimetre annual average rainfall part of New South, southern New South Wales. So it's, it's, it's perennial grazing type country. Um, and there's my trusty gator wheel. <laughs> on the left there, you've got... Um, well, property of my client, and on the right, uh, property of neighbour. Um, well, it's pretty interesting. The pasture on the right, let's have a look at a few things. It's very, very short, right? Um, it's dominated by subclover. I don't know if you can see them quite well, but all those little bits of white in that photograph are actually subclover leaves, those speckles of white, subclover flowers, my mistake, sorry, subclover flowers. As a result, um, um, as a result, w when you're looking at those, so as a result, you look at those, um, you look at that and you think, gee, there's a lot of clover there, which is, which is quite right. The other major species is capeweed. There's very little grass. Talk about that in a sec. And I happen to know, because the neighbours know neighbours and all that sort of stuff, that it's only supporting a lowish stocking rate. And, um, Likewise, more as a result, it's rarely fertilised, um, but it's got a fairly high utilisation, notionally, a high utilisation percentage. It doesn't grow much, but what grows is certainly grazed. The pasture on the left, 
uh, phalaris, annual ryegrass, silvergrass, soft brome, subclover, naturalised clovers, all that stuff you'd find in that pasture in that paddock. Uh, very little broadleaf weed. It was probably sprayed with MCPA this year and, and is regularly. Fertilised annually with superphosphate. Uh, the current coal wool is about 35. Uh, the critical value for coal wool in that paddock is 30. So, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's adequately fertilised, you know. Uh, um, and the annual stocking rate, look, nationally is probably somewhere between 15 and 20 DSC um, self-replacing merinos. Now, the reason I say that is that I think some of the, if I just go back to that previous one, I think some of the effect here is, is the fact that cattle are grazing one and, and some of the grasses don't do as well um, in cattle grazing. Um, and um, the sheep grazing here is, is having an effect as well. But I think that's pretty minor stuff compared to the, the elephant in the room. In one, um, in one, sorry, in one, we, you've got a massive amount of nitrogen being injected into the system. Sure, the clover percentage in the poor paddock is high, but it's a percentage of what? You see, because it's rarely uh, uh, fertilised, it doesn't grow a hell of a lot, right? So it, it's just not performing, right? Whereas on the other side, there's a lower clover percentage, but that clover is growing basically un, uh, uh, unlimited by um, phosphorus. So um, there's, a, there's a lack of perennial species on, on, uh, on the poor pasture, that's true. Subclover, yeah, sure, the high, the, the, in the malperformance one, there's a high proportion this year, but how much is it growing? I mean, this is the danger of percentage. You know, you might say, man, that's like 60% clover. That's not a bad pasture. But remember, nitrogen fixation by legumes is somewhere around 15 to 20 kilos of nitrogen per tonne of legume growth. Not legume percentage, legume growth. So for every tonne of legume growth, there is 15 to 20 kilos of nitrogen are fixed from the atmosphere and find their way into that into the into the nitrogen cycle of that paddock, right? Now, if you're 60% legume in that, in that unperforming pasture, if that only grows a tonne a year, that's not enough to sustain the system probably. And that's one of the reasons why it might be running down. My bet, yeah, sure, lack of phosphorus, poor legume growth, low levels of nitrogen fixation, low end pasture, and plenty of opportunity for invasion by species like Cape Wood. That's what I think. I mean, that would be, well, I haven't done a soil test in there, but I think that's a pretty clear sign of malperformance. Uh, it occurs in different ways. Why the high clover? Well, probably the high utilisation. In other words, the cattle are grazing right down to the quick, right? Um, and, and the clover does very well under those conditions. So, uh, that's what I think would be happening. Um, and again, just think of that utilisation. We often talk very notionally about utilisation um, uh, of pasture, the percentage utilisation of pasture. In, in production systems, but please remember it's a percentage, right? And so he might have, uh, you know, in the malperforming pasture, he might have a very high utilisation, but it's a very high utilisation of not much. It's the same sort of story for lambing percentages, isn't it really? Have a high lambing percentage with a very low stocking rate? I don't see the point anyway. Look, it only, look it's the same deal here. Here, um, same scenario, two different farms, only five kilometres away from the last photo, same story, all right? On one side, you've got, well, hopefully I must say our client side, managing things, you know, uh, well, what do we got here? A high stocking rate um, um, is on the left, regularly fertilised and weeds managed, um, as opposed to whatever else is going on on the right. Now, here's another malperformance photo. It's not as good as the other ones, unfortunately, because I took it late in the afternoon. I was going to show it to a group of students, but have a look at it on the left. Well, on the left, you've got a pretty well-grazed pasture and looks fairly green. On the right, well, you've just got a whole lot of residue. This photo is taken along the Billabong Creek, 600 millimetres annual average rainfall, only taken on the 7th of September this year. Both sides of the fence are phalaris-based pastures. Um, um, the pasture on the right, last summer residues dominates. Amount of available green feed is relatively low. Supports a lowish stocking rate of cattle. 
Um, I don't know anything about the fertiliser, but it looks to me like whatever's happening there, there's low utilisation. And there's a bit of a feedback there because if there's that much trash in the pasture, eventually that'll affect the amount of legume in the pasture by um, suppressing it. Um, and there'll be less nitrogen flowing through the system and we're, we're already sounds like we're on a spiral. On the left, however, or oh, it says the pasture on the right there, sorry about that, there's a pasture on the left. On the left, uh, uh, the last summer, last summer's residue is all but gone, right? Can't see much of that. There's a bit here and there, but there's hardly any here. The amount of green feed available is relatively high. I thought when I was in there somewhere around 1,500 to 2,000 kilos. It supports a medium to high stocking rate of cattle again. It's fertilised annual, the coal wall phosphate's 41. Uh, the critical for that paddock would be 34, so it's above what's required to um, uh, be fairly unlimiting for for sub clover. Interestingly, uh, the manager of the property on the left, I'll show him these photographs. He said, well, I can tell you the difference. It's easy. He said, the green one, the one on the left, is carrying a much bigger debt burden than the one on the right. Isn't that something? I think, I think we all know what he means. I mean, you have to push things if you want to pay back the debt. So the country has to be productive. Indicators of low utilisation. Well, last spring summer's production still evident after the following winter is a clear one. I mean, that really shouldn't happen except for in exceptional circumstances, uh, continued wood logging, et cetera, but basically it shouldn't happen. Um, so it means that, you know, you're growing feed but not utilising it in a timely fashion. Another indicator of low utilisation is species that don't tolerate grazing well. That makes a lot of sense. Classically, wild oats is a giveaway. But wild oats, black oats, wherever you are in the world. So if you get, when you see a high wild oat pasture, you see straight away low stocking rate, low utilisation. Have a look at this here, an experiment I did years ago, we were looking at encouraging native grasses. Don't ask me why. It's the only way I could get any money back in those days. Anyway, the, the uh, well, look at it. There you go. There's a pasture um, just east of Wagga uh, in summer, absolutely dominated by species that if there had been a decent stocking rate on the show, uh, it, it, it would disappear. You never see it. You never see it in well-managed pastures and well-utilised. Other indicators? Yeah, there are other little indicators of, you know, various, you know, various things like, you know, uh, reasonable fertility. You'll see in, in native pastures, you'll see Michaelina. In poor fertility type country, you'll see rough spear grass, et cetera, et cetera. There are species that indicate acidity, classically sorrel, but not always, because sorrel tends to hang around, especially if it's got a reasonable seed bank and, you know, it does perinate anyway. Uh, it hangs around after liming, so you can, so in the next photo, there's there's sorrel, but the pH of the paddock's five, which is, which is not what you'd normally associate with sorrel. Oh, I haven't got a photo, but when paddocks are being really, really overgrazed, you see a hell of a lot of winter grass, a power annua. Um, but I didn't get a photo of that. Here's um, this one here. All the red stuff, I don't know um, how much it'll turn up on your screens. I don't know how, but anything that's got a tinge of red in this paddock, which is near Bathunga in southern New South Wales, um, anything like that there is basically... Uh, uh, is sorrel, but the, like I said, the pH of that paddock has been adjusted, but the sorrel will be there for a while. But in general, you see a lot of sorrel, yeah, it's a tick straight away, I better go chase the acidity because it's a good bet it'll be there. Dominant spices, uh, perennial species uh, is another sign of undergrazing. This is the left, on the left, you, you're seeing a sward dominated by prairie grass. I don't know it's what they call it. It used to be called Bromus unialoides, but I think it's Bromus or Catharticus, or oh no, it's not. I can't remember what they, which species it is anymore. But anyway, um, uh, there's spring 2016, which was a big spring here. Uh, and this stuff absolutely dominated and covered everything, and as a result, there was like there was just no room for legume. Um, here's a sward dominated by phalaris. It's not a particularly good photo. I've got other clients with uh, uh, with swords where the phalaris really gets away. And for grazing, Matt, because of maybe the, the the grazing habit of stock, they never visit that part of the paddock all that well again. You, you, you tend to basically have the phalaris just crowding everything out. And, of course, 
that starts a little spiral. There's no, there's not much nitrogen in that spot there anymore because there's the legume growth is poor, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and so it becomes a lot less productive area. Um, there are ways of combating that, but uh, usually throwing a fence up or something like that uh, has been used by some of our clients to actually uh, direct the grazing in a way that more efficiently utilises that country. But, but it does happen. Uh, it happens particularly in in large paddocks. So I think many of the previous slides are really about nitrogen in one in one watt, that should say in one way or another. So um, because like like I just said, the dominance, the dominance of the perennial grasses, for instance, or the undergrazing allowing the perennial grasses to dominate means that the clover is being challenged or the lack of phosphorus nutrition. We don't measure in, but we've all got to appreciate that it actually drives growth. So we manage nitrogen, um, as I've said probably in my last talk, um, by, by through the management of the um, legume component of the pastures. And remember, it's the amount of legume growth that's important, not the proportion of the pasture that is legume. Um, managing end fixation might also require that you, you uh, address issues like soil acidity, um, other nutritional factors such as molybdenum, right? Um, recent studies in southern New South Wales have shown very poor nodulation of a lot of legumes in pastures. Now, that's not necessarily a clear cut indication of low nitrogen fixation, but it is a bit of a worry. And um, associated with that, I might say, I'm not saying it's the cause, a, a lot of those pastures in the mixed uh, farming zone were low in sulphur. Oh, I found that a bit interesting. Um, managing competition is a clear way of helping the legume to grow and therefore fix nitrogen. And of course, of well, not recent interest, but but um, it's been highlighted recently. But actually, if you think about it through history, it's been going on and on. The misuse of herbicides uh, without enough attention uh, to the health of the legume component is also a problem. Take home messages tonight because I've gone over time and probably making David mad at me. Um, I, we need to stop, we need to observe, and we need to know what we're looking at. And if you don't know what you're looking at, seek help somewhere, you know, ask somebody who does, even if you have to pay them. Observation is the start of a process that will need verification. So we're not just, you know, it's not just, oh, I think, it's not just jumping to a conclusion, it's about thinking about what the next steps might be to um, nut out a solution to the problem. Remember, undergrazing leads to low clover production. Under fertilising leads to low clover production. Overgrazing leads to opportunities for invasion. And finally, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it's the legume stupid. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. No, very, very good, very good. Very entertaining and um, very thorough analysis of the uh, factors driving visually uh, the visual factors that we can interpret to figure out what's limiting our pasture growth and, and also the importance of those factors like nitrogen and, and phosphorus in the system and and their capacity to overcome a lot of the limitations in the in the pastures so um everyone take uh, take this opportunity now to start banging your questions into the questions box there that you have available to you uh, Jim's kindly offered to stay online for as long as we want tonight uh, to answer all the questions that you may have for him, as has Nathan Ferguson, Jim's work colleague. So Nathan and Jim have a very um, thorough, uh, I suppose, a thorough skill set between them, um, or comprehensive skill set is the word. And uh, it's a good chance to make use of that while they're on board and um, and they're available. Uh, just while you're pulling your questions together there, I'll take the opportunity to thank MLA for stepping in and uh, funding this next round of uh, webinars. Uh, they, we've got a full agenda and we're taking them right through to end of this financial year. So keep an eye out on your emails and, and the odd text message coming through and uh, we'll make sure that we'll keep those uh, relevant and timely topics coming through to you guys. Now, there's going to be a webinar 
survey pop up at the end of uh, tonight's presentation. Take a, take a second to jump online there and fill that out for us. We do take notice. If there's anything uh, sinister about the feedback or something wrong with the presentation or the material, uh, then we do definitely take notice and, and make, uh, make amends. Uh, likewise, if it's positive feedback or constructive criticism, we also like to see that as well because we um, helps us guide with the direction of the webinars into the future. So, Nathan, I might pull you online there. Uh, have you? Uh, how are you going, Nathan? Sorry, guys, just waiting. Okay, yeah, thank you. We're, we're muting and unmuting myself at the same time, I think, Dave. <laughs> thank you. Um, firstly, I'd, I'd like to, to say um, once we were invited last week to, to make this presentation, I've put a lot of thought into it, and it's good to see Jim and I, without having spoken much about this presentation, is exactly what uh, I've been thinking about. It's, it's about what don't we see in productive in unproductive pastures so it's really good so well done jim big pat on the back for pulling that together for us and getting us across the line no worries no worries nathan thanks for that um so nathan i'll leave you unmuted and and jim i'll i'll unmute you as well so you can uh uh get stuck in and answer some of these questions um i might take the opportunity to lead a question here. Uh, Nathan, you might be able to um, contribute, or Jim, um, with regards to perenniality in pastures, you know, there's, there's a pretty common school of thought that per perenniality is, is, is uh, what we need, uh, or as much perenniality in pastures is, is preferable. But tonight, you know, there was a uh, mention that uh, maybe too much perenniality could be um, um, compromising the uh, the clovers and or the legumes and hence nitrogen and uh, overall pasture production. Um, yeah, I think Dave, what you also see there is it's a combination of grazing management. I, I think I, I know I've got several clients that have um, photos just like that one of Jim's where the phalaris is dominant, and it tends to well, seems to me to be more about the grazing management within that situation, as well as um, the fertility of the paddocks, because the, the, the fertility does seem to run down, um, and then the clover just drops out. So there is a fine line to uh, having the perennial in the system. Jim, your thoughts? Well, I just think, you know, when you're talking about perennial cover, yeah, I must admit, like, like I tried to say in the talk, I think it's there are... I, there are no hard and fast rules, but I think if the grazing's managed well, right, then um, I, I don't think we, I think we rarely see Phalaris knocking it, say, well, in this particular case, and I apologise to everybody who thinks we're being far too parochial, I get that, but I don't think we see I don't think we see the perennial knocking about the clover when the grazing's managed well when the utilisation is about right. Now, sure, from year to year, there's going to be problems. Like, you get a spring like 2016, there is no way you're going to keep up with with the perennial. It's just, it is going to go ballistic and there is going to, and there's going to be some negative impact on uh, the clover. But think back to that photo that I showed you towards the end there of, of where last year's trash was still in the paddock in September versus last year's trash was all but gone. Now, they didn't, as I remember it, I was driving through that paddock last year, they didn't look all that different then uh, in in um, in summer last year. They didn't, right? But in the meantime, you've got high utilisation, which is actually helping um, uh, and aiding um, um, clover production. Yeah, spot on. Thank you, Jim. Jim, can I, just, can, I, can I just jump in there as well? Like, when I was with DPI, I was in a paddock, at, or two paddocks at Adelong with a, with a producer there and he had a phalaris subclover pasture in two paddocks one was um, clover dominant the other one was phalaris dominant and he was wanting to know why or or how he could shift the the composition of the two pastures and when i discussed with him what his grazing management was the the paddock that had uh, a lot of subclover in it 
it um, was grazed all winter and all spring, leading to um, a lot of seed set within the subclover. So my my thoughts, my suggestion to him was, whatever you're doing in the subclover paddock, and you want that to happen in the other paddock, then do that in there. And he did, and and the composition changed very quickly. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Um, really good answers there. Now we've got a fair few questions lining up here, guys. And what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll ask the audience number one to nominate a preferred uh, question answerer. So if you are going to answer, ask a question, just put a put the name of the person that you're directing it towards in your question, and I'll direct it that way. Uh, I just suspect that the night might get a bit long if we. Um, have two answers, uh, but what I'll do is I'll I'll try and pick and choose between these here for Jim and Nathan, and um, if one or the other thinks uh, you know they are or the other is the best to answer it, then I'll let them make that decision. So first question here, guys, uh, from Joe Lane: How practical is use of nutrient export of prod, uh, of sheep, cattle, wool? In forming annual fertilizer recommendations, especially in comparison to soil tests, um, maybe Nathan, maybe. Oh, mm -hmm. oh well, no, um, Nathan. I, I was actually going to let, let I was going to let you do that one, Jim, and you. Oh, look, uh, I think. Look, yeah, I'll I'll just quickly do it. Look, um, I think we've pretty much settled. Um, uh, pretty much settled on the basis of managing. And I'm only going to talk about phosphorus with respect to this, but the fertilizer management is guided along by the level of P in the soil and how that is related to what what we think is required to make the legume perform um, at near its optimum. Now, uh, I'm saying legume because uh, it is pretty much known that the critical value for grass production is about you know, about two thirds that required for legume production. So legume has a higher no, uh, phosphorus requirement than grasses. And because of all the stuff I was talking about before, we want to get the legume nutrition right. Okay, so I don't do any budgeting of, of where that's going. There's too many. Uh, I think there's. I think that'd be quite difficult. I think the best approach is to is to test the soils routinely. And Nathan and I, the in the middle of our annual surge into about a thousand paddocks or more of testing soil and then making recommendations based on on those results um i um it, yeah there are problems with it I, I we could have a long discussion but in the end i think it's the most objective way that we've been able to approach it all right spot on thank you jim question here from um another jim what are the economics of spreading urea on a pasture of say rye grass and barley grass in a good year. Um, me, Nathan, or you? Quick. Uh, you do it. Well, uh, um, uh, depends on the time of year, but the economics. Um, I think there's some interesting stuff coming. Um, uh, that uh, I think Cameron Goulet has come up with a computer model. I haven't read it a, 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 a way of predicting all this, but. But the answer to that question is, it's all about how much uh, dry matter that you'll produce per unit of nitrogen applied. Um, and the economics um, often, f I mean, you can get a good economic return out of, out of supplying nitrogen that way. Um, usually, I, I don't know, we've actually contemplated this on a property where bull production is the major uh is 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 the major enterprise um and you know bloat is such a problem that we've wondered whether we should have legumes at all and we should just go to an in, in entire uh application of urea i think that might get um that might get um uh, extremely expensive and it needs that would need a, a quite a thoroughgoing economic analysis in in the shorter term uh, if that's what you're asking in the shorter term um you know, depending where you are and depending on the time of year, you know, levels of anywhere between, I don't know, five and 25 kilos of dry matter per unit of nitrogen can be achieved. And so you can work back pretty quickly um, um, to, uh, to arrive at a conclusion of, of, of um, 
of uh, how advantageous that would be in your business. Um, but basically, I don't think um, I, if the pasture is nitrogen responsive, I don't think you can lose money on the deal if the urea is applied in such a way that it doesn't volatilise, you know, that the urea actually gets in the ground. Oh, awesome. Right. Yeah, thank you, Jim. The other component is the other component that is how much legumes in the system um, is it providing anything? If there's no legume, then it would be a lay down mazare just about to use urea, would it not? Thanks, Nate. Nate, this is a question that might be suited to you, so just uh, stay tuned there. In a good pasture, say with 30% legume, um, how many tonnes of legume growth and what is the urea equivalent? Um, it will depend on, on your location and your rainfall. Uh, for us up here in the high rainfall area around um, Chermit and Adelong, um, we should be 30% uh, um, bit under three tonnes to the hectare. So using Jim's numbers of 20 kilograms per tonne of uh, dry matter, that's 60 kilograms of nitrogen equivalent to um, um, about 180 odd kilos of, of urea. Yeah, that's spot on. Thanks, Nate. Which that's pretty, pretty, um, um, pretty straight. Um, just, to, just remembering too that that's year in year out, right? Um, so that's ev that would be every year that you that that's being added. And the other thing to also say about that is um, uh, the the there is a value of the clover directly in animal production. So I know we've been talking about nitrogen and pasture malperformance, et cetera, but there's a direct animal production value of having clover. And I think most studies show again about that 30 or 40%. So it's worth thinking about that as well. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Jim, this is a question that's been directed to you. What rate and time is best to spray with MCPA? What are the negative effects that this may have on clover in the pasture? Yeah, I, well, I'm, Nath might pick, pick it up too. So, so um, right, I, I think I think the time basically, I think, well, I actually think midwinter is a good time, right? Um, I think a, a fair way away from um, reproductive uh, production um, is good. Um, and um, after how many leaves, Nath, would you say? Three. After three leaves, but we tend to do it a little bit later than that usually. Why? Because sometimes we're waiting for the broad leaves to actually, uh, all the broad leaves to, that we want to capture uh, to germinate as well. So um, I would think, I would usually, most of our clients are probably spraying, um, um, you know, from mid June onwards. Uh, most of them stopping, you know, usually all of them are stopped by mid-August. Would that be true, Nath? Oh, sort of. Um, some some still going in September up here in the high country um, oh and some probably even looking at, at um, probably not MCPA at this late stage, but ways to control late saffron thistles um, using yeah. Gramoxone. Um, another, the other part of that question was um, what sort of rate. It's quite surprising, actually. I look back. There's a, a paper published by Sandral et al. and they did some work on this in the early 90s uh, in southern New South Wales. They used much higher rates, right, um, than um, like one kilo active ingredient, I think, um, than are, than is commonly applied, and they didn't get much of an effect. Uh, on um, seed production or herbage production. But I, I, I mean, we, we tend to settle on, you know, for ease of, for ease of memory, about 700 mils of uh, an MCPA 750 uh, type formulation is normally, um, and, and that's in, a, that's, sorry, that's in an enterprise where we'd be spray grazing, where we'd be using animals. Uh, we'd be using sheep to, um, to um, multiply the effect. Thanks, Jim. I, I hope that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Jim. A um, uh, question this, uh, a question from uh, from Marty up at Tamora. Um, thanks, Marty. Uh, I think this is directed at you again, Jim. Jim, it's this year the frosts have toughened up the late 
winter and early spring feed. Can you please explain uh, the digestibility and the production value of this year's pastures? Oh, oh. <laughs> um, so the question is this year the frosts have dealt an incredible blow to uh, is that what we mean toughened up have, have made it very difficult uh, it's a combination of, I yeah I, I think it's a combination of frost and lack of rainfall in june the, the, the short answer is um um as one wag once said green is good i i, I saw what happened to a, a hell of a lot of pasture this year is uh, even for um, for space pastures too a lot of leaf got knocked off uh, essentially by the frosts uh, the, the resulting digestibility impact is 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 quite marked it, it falls down it, it falls down a fair bit right so uh, in digestibility I, I, um, you know it wouldn't surprise me to see a 10 to 15 percent I mean that yeah that leaf goes yellow don't be surprised to see that leaf you know plummeting 10 to 15 digestibility units um, now um, so so this uh this happened yeah and of course the other classic species that it happens to is barley grass as well i should say i mean barley grass really gets touched up by frosts um, um so it's still there it's still living of course it's it's going to provide its headaches in spring for us but it's not producing very healthy green leaf for us and so i expect that the answer might be uh in only a qualitative way uh, you know, I expect the decline, the decline to be directly related to how much green leaf was no longer green. You know, how much it had turned, how much it had turned yellow, and and that very, in my observations this year, that varied from pasture to pasture. But certainly, barley grass phalaris, um, uh, in particular, were two species that got hammered well and truly. Awesome, thanks, Jim. Uh, Jim, a question, a question from Nicole. Uh, do you recommend, and if so, what type of nitrogen fertilisers would you recommend to correct the deficiencies uh, like we saw in tonight's presentation? Oh, Nicole, such a difficult question. Okay, so we were talking about system deficiencies tonight, and we were talking about something's wrong with that system. Um, so I... And so basically, most of the systems in southern New South Wales actually rely on nitrogen fixation. So what I would do is probably, I would use nitrogen fertiliser to confirm my thoughts. And I'm, I think this is a really good test. I, I really would have liked to have put this in the talk. So I think if you saw some of the things you saw tonight and think, I, I think there's a real problem here, you might go out with a bag of urea and spread it and spread it at about 200 kilos, um, you know, at the start of September or something like that. And you see one one side take off and the other side, you know, in comparison to the unfertilized bit, and say, oh my goodness, there's just not enough nitrogen in my system, right? I reckon I reckon that is a great way, a great approach to diagnosis. However. The system is the system, and if in the end economically it's going to work on legume-based nitrogen, then I think the thing to do would be to embark on a series of management measures that increased the legume production in those systems, even if it meant, and it's not necessarily inexpensive, but even if it meant deliberately reintroducing um, legume seed um, into the pasture, um, and it would certainly mean in some of those cases that you saw tonight, uh, it would certainly mean uh, upping the amount of, uh, in some of them, not all, but upping the amount of um, uh, available phosphorus. Uh, but, but so the system, so really we're talking about the symptom is the nitrogen, right? That's, that's the big symptom in one way or another. But the, but the, um, but the uh, solution has to be in running running the current system better. Um, uh, so I would be still uh, championing Bill Clinton. <laughs> it's the legume. <laughs> it's the legume. Anyway, I'm not trying to avoid your question, um, but but thinking about that bull proposition that I talked a bit about earlier, yeah, look, we'd be just talking about urea. Um, in that sort of system. I don't think the owners will let me ever do it. So 
<laughs> so they'll always say no, but it's just a little thing that goes on in my head every so often where I think, really, I wonder if this whole system would work if we just forgot the legume altogether, forgot, all, you know, we can't have black capsules anymore, et cetera. For, you, know, you know, it's terrible to see a $25,000 bull, you know, in potential, right, keel over. So maybe the idea is, you know, maybe the idea is to run those sort of systems um, on urea only, but I haven't really done the economics on that. So, Jim, as for the product, it would be the cheapest form of nitrogen we can get our hands on. That's the short answer, I suppose, yeah, Nicole. If chicken. Yeah, that's right. If it was chicken poo, you'd use it. Yeah, well, thank you, guys. Um, so, a question um, yeah, led by a, a compliment. Great talk, Jim. There you go. That's good. That's good to hear. That's all I want to hear. That's the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> there is some more, though. There's a bit of interrogation here. Oh. The paddock that had the windrows um, of green due to the silage. Yes, yes. Now, yes. Ross wants to know whether there, you tested the end levels between uh, on the windrows and between the windrows because he, no. he yes. asked, could the higher levels of cover or organic matter have contributed to the increased growth along the windrows? Yeah, well, um, it's a great question because uh, I talked about this with the owner and the owner made the observation. I, I mean, I only saw that it's, it's actually a paddock I don't go into in servicing um, this property because it's just a small little paddock near the house that just gets cut for silage. But interestingly, the owner made the observation that those windrowed areas were much slower to get away, right? And and so they actually started slow and then they just took off. Now, the organic matter, well, I'd say the answer to that is yes, but I, w I didn't test. Um, I didn't test uh, because I didn't think it was that critical. Um, um, the only wanted to know whether it was potassium or not, and I thought, no, um, not given the amount of potassium in, his, in those paddocks around, so I didn't think that was likely a goer. I couldn't see any signs of potassium deficiency anyway. Um, but anyway, so I came down to nitrogen. But the organic matter, yes, but only in, only in as much, I think anyway, that, you know, the more organic matter, the more nitrogen cycling, et cetera, the more nitrogen available. So, so you've got a lot of organic matter there, you know, eventually... Um, the uh, it mineralizes. Uh, there's more nitri nitrate and, and ammonia available, uh, ammonium available in the soil, and off you go, right? I, I, I think that's yeah. It's true to say I never verified that, and it's not such a big issue that we we, we need to. But it was just uh, when you walk through that part, it was so stunning. I thought I'd show the photograph, but but um, um, Certainly, I think the organic matter through nitrogen cycling is a yes, um, um, but it's very interesting to note that it had the... So what you're seeing there is really fast growth despite the slower start. And that slower start would have been because nitrogen tie-up, um, as those microbes used it as a source rather than... Uh, used it, the available nitrogen as a source rather than breaking down the organic matter compared yeah. to later in the season where it's mineralised and become readily available. Yeah, good point, good point. Thank you, Nathan. There's a question here, and maybe Jim wants to have a rest for a moment. Um, Nathan, you might want to handle this one. Um, there's a question from Alana, re, question re subsoil acidity um, in established pasture. Is it possible to correct without incorporation of lime? If not, are there methods to incorporate the lime sufficiently um, that would not over wouldn't jeopardise a loose and rye sub clover pasture. Uh, it would depend on at what depth are we talking. Um, if we're talking below that in that ten to twenty centimetre layer, um, you could probably do something about it, but it would take some aggressive manoeuvring to, to move it through the profile quickly. If we maintain the pH, what is it, Jim? Five point seven calcium chloride? Five, um, or is it 5.5? Yeah, 5.5-ish. Yep. So if we maintain greater than 5.5 in the surface, there is leaching 
um, down through the profile. So if you're trying to maintain a loosened stand that you know has an acid subsoil um, issue or has had in the past, maintaining that pH at 5.5 calcium chloride will help alleviate any issues. As for deep ripping to get it down there, I just don't think you get enough down there to have an impact. Yeah, what, I think did, that's, what did you see, Jim, there just, from Holbrook with? Yeah, yeah. So, so that uh, what Nath was talking about, um, some of that's based on some work that was done in um, uh, Book Book in southern New South Wales, and they were doing it, I think, on sort of filarious based pastures, but keeping the oh look they kept the surface say between 5.2 and 5.7 averaging out at around 5.5 and that ameliorated subsurface ph that's um and they define that as in this case um fairly shallow really between 15 and 20 centimeters at at the rate of about point i think 0.044 ph units per year so that's just by surface liming so, um, Dave, um, in answer to Alana's question, I can only say there's probably a whole webinar on liming that would be well worth uh, investigating at some stage. But I agree with Nathan. I don't think any aggress. I, I just think, um, I think the best thing you could do is keep um, keep monitoring the surface and keep the pH up on the surface. Um, and that would probably be, I mean, through time, it's a it's a long term issue. Through time, that would be the best approach. I mean, oh, yeah. Right. And I and I agree with Nathan on the deep sand, deep yeah, the deep ripping and stuff like that. I just don't think we get enough in. Oh well, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Nathan, you might want to tackle this one as well. Um, um, how do you judge the fixation of nitrogen that is happening? That's from Colin. Um, how do we judge it? Well, we, we first of all have to look at how much dry matter the legume is producing. Um, second of all, we need to look at the effectiveness of the nodulation of the of the plant. So the only way to do that is to dig them up and, and wash the roots out very carefully and, and look at the nodules. Um, a poorly nodulated um, stand of subclover won't be fixing as much nitrogen as a well nodulated stand. Um, there is plenty of images. Um, Helen Burns has been presenting a lot of data around lately with some photos, not just Helen, um, the, the local land services team, um, with photos of nodulation score of what they were seeing. Uh, but like Jim said, um, it seemed to have some relationship with sulphur um, and I also wonder whether or not the sampling technique was truly representative. Okay, right. Yeah, your thoughts? Yeah, just hang a tick. Colin, really difficult question because the nice right on the money. Um, I think even even the scientists uh, uh, have a few problems with this. They used to use acetylene reduction and all this sort of stuff. Um, but in the end, I've just got to add one thing to what Nate said. It, it just pays to start the process out properly. So when you're sowing a pasture, make sure that the legume is nodulated with the latest strains of rhizobia. Make sure if it's subclover that you're inoculating it yourself or having it locally inoculated so it can be sown as close to the date of inoculation as possible. This precludes unfortunately, and now I can invite all sorts of rash comments, I'm sure, this precludes the, the purchase of expensive, colourful, um, uh, coated seed uh, with, uh, not always, but with a, a possibility of um, uh, inactive or dead rhizobia inside the pellet. And it's just, so the way to be absolutely sure is, is And I had one client this year, unfortunately, they got somebody to pellet their seed uh, for them and they did a shocking lime pellet and they did a shocking job. It blocked up the seeder and they, they now hate my guts, I can tell you. I hope they're not listening, but I think they hate me. <laughs> but, but the point is, but the point is that wasn't done properly and that was the that problem. But if it's done properly, um, then I think it is, you've got a higher possibility of getting the desired result. So 
Mm. Okay. And Please don't ask me questions about that. <laughs> and at this point, there's still no data to change that recommendation, Jim, that uh, no. the pre-inoculated subclover seed still is providing um, um, dead rhizobia on the seed. So until we see data that, that proves it is working again, then we need to inoculate as close to sowing as possible um, either by yourself or by a merchant in town within hours or days of you sowing. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Jim. Now, just to help you judge the, how comprehensive your question, your answers will be, um, we've still got about, I'm just doing a scan here, probably about 10 or 12 questions keep to cover going. off on. Keep going, Dave. So we'll keep cracking on here. Um, Question here from Philip. Um, uh, this is a very pra pragmatic question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll aim it at you, Jim, for a start. Is stocking rate a fair guide to the performance of a pasture? I think over, yeah, great question because I think over the long term, I think it is. I think it's a fair guide over the long term. The problem is, um, what do you mean by stocking rate? Do you mean stocking rate of the property or stocking rate of that particular paddock? Very few people actually take paddock-based data for stocking rate. And there's a few problems with that too when you think about the rate at which animals are gaining or losing weight and how that affects their DSC value. But nonetheless, um, ultimately, I think that would be true. I wish in Australia we had some sort of, um, like we almost do in the cropping zone, where you have the sort of French and Schultz um, benchmark water use efficiencies, et cetera. I wish we had something that was robust enough um, uh, in the pasture world, uh, in the, sorry, livestock production world. But um, I would think um, that as a generalisation, that's okay, but it, you, you just want to do a bit of thinking about this. When things start to spiral downwards, your stocking weight probably, I'll, I'll give you an example. Perhaps you have, you've latched on to some alternative notions and suddenly you've decided to stop fertilising and, you know, I don't know, dance at midnight to the moon or some damn thing, I don't know. <laughs> right. Now, you actually won't see the impact of that of withholding fertilizer for a few years, I believe, right? Because the nitrogen will still be, you know, it'll take a few years to, for the for the for the P levels to drop in the soil. The nitrogen will still be um, cycling round, and everything could look like it's okay. And and I, I actually think it's a sort of like the proverbial frog in 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 boiling water type syndrome, basically. That you really. Um, they showed that's all nonsense on Mythbusters, by the way, but that's another issue. But the, the, what I'm trying to say is you won't see that straight away. Your stocking rate would be about right, but there would be other evidence that things are starting not quite to add up. So I'd say in general, yes, but if you're making radical moves, um, then, or yeah, I think it's possible for stocking rate to perhaps mislead uh, to some degree, if it's paddy, if it's property stocking rate, I think there's a very strong possibility that it could mislead you due to this, you know, spatial variation between paddocks, etc. Um, but if it's paddock to paddock stocking rate, then yeah, I think it's sort of okay. But but there's a few provisos that one would want to um, be aware of. Spot on, right? Now. Thanks, Jim. Another question directed straight at you there. Um, is there a Estimated, is there an estimated cost of renovating a paddock like yours to a perennial phalaris clover? That's from Jim V. Is that a, a paddock like mine, that one at the start? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I, I, um, yeah, the, well, in most, most times when people are thinking about this, they think about lost production. Well, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's no lost production off that paddock. So, I would think I, I'd be quite bullshy about the amount of lime I'll put on. It's only a small paddock. I'll, I'll probably put on three to four tonnes of lime. So work that cost out depending on your lime cost. What's that, about 70 bucks a tonne um, spread? So 
um, probably somewhere between 150 to 200 bucks in cash for all the other stuff, the fertilizer, the seed. Um, um, I don't know if I get out of that little paddock for less than 450 bucks a hectare, I'd be most surprised. Mm. There you go. Um, uh, but in general, for um, for clients, I mean, it, it's often uh, loss of production is taken into account. We're still around actually the same sort of dough, you know. We're still in the same sort of ballpark. It's an expensive. Um, I don't want to get on my hobby horse here. But it's an extremely expensive process. That's why we are very, very careful to take as uh, as few risks as possible. So the the requisite spraying out of the paddock the year before, um, uh, careful management um, um, of sowing, in particular sowing depth. I can't tell you how often it's a killer. Um, and post sowing management, particularly putting insect uh, residual insecticides into the system. All of this stuff adds up. Yes, it costs, but it adds up to success. And because it's such an expensive business, we, we must have, and because the seed is small, we just must have success. So, um, yeah, look, fours to $500 wouldn't surprise me. Right, Errol, thank you. Nath, this may be a question suitable for you. This is from Ryan. Have you trialled much, uh, now stick with me, prop, propizamide? Pro... Um. Yes, yeah, propizamide. Yeah, propizamide. What used to be called curb. Have you tried much propizamide in phalaris based pastures for annual grass control? Uh, um, you know, the, the short answer for me is, is no. Um, however, simazine is uh, another one that does the job. I, I think what we've got to remember with winter cleaning pastures is that once you take those plants out, if you do nothing in two to three years' time, you'll be in the same predicament. Um, I think the key is, is to replace the silver grass with something else. So uh, if you're using propizamide or simazine to clean those winter winter grasses like silver grass up, then the following year, I think it would be a wise move to come in and add some new subclover varieties as well as some annual ryegrass into the system. What do you think, Jim? Yeah, I've, um, um, I haven't used uh, uh, much propizamide. I think it's becoming a bit more popular because it's becoming cheaper. I've, you might want to confirm that, but I think that's the case. So we have considered using it in some cropping systems where we're looking for a different herbicide group um, in the loosened pastures. But I haven't been, uh, I, I, we haven't, um, it hasn't been used at the moment as a, um, by our client bases uh, in the phalaris based pastures. Right, Al. Thank you, Jim. Jim uh, and Nath, you might have to help me interpret this question from Ollie. Um, if we if we can't interpret it correctly, we might need to get Ollie to to um, write it write it again. But why are we not seeing diminishing pasture growth in the neighbour's paddock as you get further from the fence? Full stop. Assuming the spreader has some overlap going into the neighbours, I suspect Ollie's talking about your picture earlier jim well i, I you'd, hope I, um, the, you'd hope the spread is not spreading into the neighbor's place well i can I, I, look let me let me offer let me offer e even if it was a bit right imagine the neighbors let's just let's um let's just speculate here a little bit imagine the neighbors putting out low phos no phosphate right and imagine um uh, my clients putting out phosphate every annually okay and some of it sort of randomly depending on where he's driving stuff every so often goes over the fence it's the only injection essentially of phosphate into the neighbor's system so so what would happen would be that uh, largely that phosphate would cycle through that entire paddock and get spread by dung and urine into the rest of the place right pretty quickly also it would uh, I have to tell you, if his coal phosphate was around 10 or 11 and he was just getting um, my client's maintenance application, it probably wouldn't move it that far. It's not that such a big, I mean, yeah. if, if he's got 10 and 11, right, and he was my client, we'd be into that joint with 200 to 250 kilos of superphosphate for the next three to four, five years, right? 
So the little bit of not, the little bit of phosphorus that's getting injected that system by overlap on the fence would be spread by stock around the paddock to some degree, but also hardly be enough to tick up um, to tick up the um, um, the soil phosphorus test um, 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 in those spots. It just it just wouldn't touch the sides. That would be my. I, I think that, I would suspect that would be the major. That would be the major um, operating factor. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, uh, Nathan, maybe a question for you. We have a Phalaris fog grass-based pasture with low clover content, which are pretty well heavily grazed pastures of late. Probably not grazed heavily enough uh, over about ten years ago when they had cattle only. Sand over clay country with a potassium desiccant. Uh, will potash help with clover percentage and how could we reduce fog grass content without knocking the phalaris out? Mm, good question. That's a, a very good question. Um, there's lots of it depends in there. Um, provided your cobalt P is not limiting, um, then and your potassium is limiting, correcting the potassium deficiency would certainly help productivity in that paddock. As for uh, flicking out the fog grass, I'm not sure that there's an answer to that. Um, yeah, I don't think there's an answer. The only the only possible way would be to um, to graze it down hard so that the, the livestock selectively graze the phalaris out and leave the fog grass a bit higher and possibly wick wipe the uh, the fog grass out. I couldn't think of another way. Right, yeah. Al. Thanks, Nate. It's, um, uh, there's a good question here um, from Tim. I know Tim's down in Tasmania, but I think it's a generic question. Is there any downside to using gibberellic acid, Jim? Um, Tim, I think most of the data suggests um, that is not the case. Um, I would only add to the. Uh, so what do I mean? Well, it's not quite physiologically true. I think it's a little bit more uh, detailed, but a lot of people say it using gibberellic acid as in inverted commas bringing growth forward but it essentially does that there's a little less growth in spring um, and there's um, um, more growth in winter so i suppose the downside would be less growth in spring it's not such a downside because usually there's an excess that's so not such a problem um, i have not seen any data that suggests and i'm fortunately i'm going to restrict my comments to phalaris but i haven't seen any data suggest that the um, persistence of phalaris uh, is endangered by using progib um, and i haven't seen any data suggest even that the legume content is much affected either so um, i harbor these dreams of doing some work on grazing and barley grass control and using progib and grazing in combination i never get around to doing the trial work but I don't see any negative impact of ProJib that I've I haven't come across any. Um, um, right, Al. and certainly I can't remember any in the literature. Thanks, Jim. So it, it might depend if you're thinking of using it at this late stage because it's still cold in Tasmania. Um, like Jim said, you, you will bring that growth forward. But if growth isn't limited in the springtime, um, is that such an issue if feed is limited now? Thanks, Nathan. Good point. Really good point. Now, just moving on. Now, this is a uh, a question that I was tempted to ask, actually. Um, and Jim V, thank you for asking so many good questions. Um, I'll leave this open to both of you. Are there any visible signs of molybdenum deficiency in a phalaris clover-based pasture? I believe the answer to that is no. Mm. I think Nathan? the major... Op Nath, what do you think? I think. Oh, oh sorry. I'm, I just I'm think with the answer is no because the the major operation of molybdenum is on nitrogen fixation, right? And so you might say, in a, in a broad sense, if there was absolutely no molybdenum there, the probably it would be manifested by lack of nitrogen, actually. But I'm 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 not. I'm. Uh, yeah, it just could be my limited background, but I, I don't know of any uh, MO deficient symptoms per se. So our simple approach with clients is an application every five to six years. Um, and 
and leave it at that. And, and I must say, when we get to most clients' places for the first time, it's just, you know, we do a bit of a fertiliser plan with them after we've done some testing. It's always a question, how long since you put MO on? Oh, usually decades. So we have no way of telling by looking at the clover. We just put it on. Nate? Awesome. Yeah, good response, Jim. That's, that's exactly right. Thanks. Thanks, though, Jim. Thanks, Nate. Really good. Um, it was starting to whittle them down. We've still got 40-odd uh, people uh, uh, who are engaged in the presentation, which is a credit to both of you guys for keeping uh, everything up and going. But a quick question here. I've still got 300 mils of wine, so let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to keep you from that any longer, Jim. Please comment no, on, the, on the best use of drones and drone photography for the short and long-term monitoring of pastures. Nath, have you got any thoughts there? Yeah, I think at this point in time, um, they're, they're more a toy because you've still got to get down on the ground and verify what you're looking at. Um, if we, if drones would do the job that we could do, um, I'm sure Jim would have that 300 mils of wine uh, more regularly and more often um, <laughs> because it would keep us out of the paddock a lot more. Um, to use drones um, to look at the the in the in the VI the index um, yeah look what to tell you what what are you looking at yeah are you looking at a, a nutrient deficiency you're looking at overgrazing you're looking at weed patch you're looking at insect problems you've got to get out in the field and, and have a look so it may well you, the drones may well be highlighting areas of concern in which case you get a, a knowledgeable person in to help solve the problem. Comments, Jim, anything Yeah, extra? look, I, just not so much to add to it, but just to clarify, it's it's not as if we're Luddites. Actually, Nathan and I tried, um, uh, well, a more proximal sort of version of that. We 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 mounted cameras on our, our gators and took photos all over paddocks and geolocated them and stuff like that. And in the end, even a photo taken from, oh, I don't know, a height of what, one and a half metres or whatever it was, some thereabouts, you know. Yeah, something two, like that. One and a half to two metres. You know, we still couldn't tell the species apart adequately, you know. Like, it was really hard. And so and the I time it took. And the time it took. But, but all right, the drain would take less time, but the biggest problem would be the time you take looking at the photos. So but until we get... what some, I mean, the, the time to look at the photo, Jim, not so much the, the yeah. collected data. But the... But, if we get to a point one day where we're running algorithms that can identify the different species, yeah, I reckon there's a potential there. We're not there yet. There's no doubt about that. There's effort gone into that. Um, there's no doubt about that. But un until we get there, I think it's like Nate said, I think it's more the remote sensing of, um, uh, you know, perhaps pasture greenness, NDVI and a few other things that might be useful for us. But um, I'm very, I don't want to sound like a Luddite, but I'm very wary that, that, you know, there has to be good science underpinning the use of the technology. And I'm, I'm afraid in some areas, precision agriculture is one of them, the technology is leading, is leading us by the nose, but without necessarily the really good science to back it up. Oh, please don't abuse me too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Nate. That actually wraps up. A, a drone, I think, a drone that I think would be very useful would be little solar powered thing that drove around the paddock, and it took dry matter cuts and told you how much dry matter was there, and then sorted it into its components so that you knew that X percent is grass, X percent legume, X percent broadleaf weeds, and and of the grasses, which of the which grasses are useful, which ones aren't. That would be a great drone. Spot on. Um. <laughs> I reckon we need to get a hold of some tech company, um, maybe NASA. But look, well, NASA can put a satellite on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that, that looks like it wraps up the questions uh, for tonight's webinar. If there, if there is any last-minute questions out there that, you, uh, that you've got burning and you really want to ask these guys before they head off for their evening please jump it in uh, jump in now and and ask it otherwise i'm just going to take the opportunity to give next webinar next week's webinar a plug don't forget wednesday next week same time same place uh, hamish dixon from agri partner a a 
Rubinet nutritionist specialist out of South Australia is going to be presenting on what we need to do to our pastures or what our pastures need to look like to have our lamb growth rates above 300 grams a day from birth through to slaughter. So a lot of data in the industry saying that we can do it, but there's also data saying that at a, in a practical context, it's not happening. So next week's webinar is going to be very interesting. Got a good man on the job to present uh, on this topic, and it's not before time, considering the um, some of the uh, some of the claims of high lamb growth rates that aren't really being backed up at a practical context. Okay, don't forget to have a crack at the webinar survey when you leave tonight. Leave some feedback, and um, that'd be much appreciated. Thank you to MLA for sponsoring tonight, and thank you very much to Jim and Nathan for such a uh, comprehensive presentation. Hooray! Thanks, Nate. Thank you. Right now, guys, and uh, from all here at the MLA webinar team, have a good evening.